This is The Baseline, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Welcome everybody, you're tuned to The Baseline, Cali Warnshaw, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Spring is almost here. You know what that means? No, man, it ain't because of baseball or March Madness. Don't forget all that crap. It's almost the stretch run for the NBA regular season. And we have got a lot of stuff to get into. We got a great co- uh, great, great uh, guest on board with us to break down a team that I cannot believe that I, it's even going to come out of my mouth as we speak this. It's almost blasphemous how it may actually ooze out of us. Could we potentially be talking about one of the, the, the dynastic teams right now in the NBA not making the playoffs? Who would think it? I'm not even going to try. I'm trying to shed the thought. Let me go ahead and roll out the red carpet to my right-hand man, 50 grand, and be aficionado, www.shawsports.net, Big Kahuna PNC, my man, Warren Shaw, repping out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Holler back at me, Mr. Shaw. I, I can't say it, man, because if I try to say that, man, I- I- thunder might strike down upon me. We already had a Nor'easter, and another one might be coming along the way, and it might be because I'm thinking such dreadful thoughts about a dynastic team not making the NBA playoffs, bro. Now, just like Rihanna would say, man, wild, wild thoughts, yo. This is crazy, you know, what we would potentially be talking about. Um, but we'll get to that in the breakdown. Uh, so salute to all the fans of the NBA Baseline. It's going to be another amazing show. Great guests coming on board. Great, great topic of the drop. <laughs> Definitely got our, our juices and bloods going here a little bit, too. And I think it will get you guys, we can get you guys pumping as well, too. So, as always, man, can't wait to jump right in. It's going to be an amazing show. Definitely. So, as always, be sure to get my man Shaw at Shaw Sports NBA or get at me at Game Face Lee, the show's Twitter handle at NBA Baseline, available on all the major platforms. You know how we do, man. Download any one of those iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Microsoft, tune in. Uh, listen, we're on. Uh, we're featured on Dash Radio. I mean, we're all over the place, man. This is how we do it. This is the this is why we do it. We do it for you. Uh, we love covering the NBA, so we always like getting your ears filled with that good NBA conversation. You know how we do. I'm not even going to tell you what we got going on for this show, man. Like my man Shaw said, man, he's got it lined up real nice. So much so that we're going to make it a surprise. We're just going to hit you with it right from the get-go. You know how we do, and you know how we roll. It's time now for the breakdown. Time to break it down. Break down to the bone gristle. Time now for the breakdown. Cal Lee Warren Shaw of the Baseline NBA Podcast. This week, main topic of conversation for the breakdown, it is the San Antonio Spurs. And I, it's hard to imagine that we're talking about the San Antonio Spurs kind of like with a lot of, of hesitance. Um, almost trepidation is probably the best way to put it because – I'm finding it really hard to believe that at this moment in time, we're actually talking about the San Antonio Spurs possibly not even making this year's playoffs. And to even put that in context, it would be difficult for even my mind to kind of fathom this. So probably someone that can help me talk me off this ledge of anxiety about this. We got our man, Paul Garcia. He covers the Spurs. Uh, he has a, a fabulous uh, podcast, uh, the uh, the Spurs cast. Uh, he's a writer for Project Spurs. Paul, thanks for jumping on board with us this week to kind of help talk me off the ledge, man. I, I need to get talked off the ledge when we're talking about these Spurs, brother. Yeah, I mean, you're not the only one. The whole city of San Antonio is kind of on the ledge, too, and, and they're not used to this. This is this is something that hasn't happened since uh, before Tim Duncan was drafted. That's the last time the Spurs missed the playoffs. Yeah, it's kind of like the New England Patriots not getting to the Super Bowl. Like, can you imagine, like, New England fans, like, just sitting there saying, we got all the way to the AFC Championship just to lose to some other team? Like, it doesn't make sense. So the fact that we're talking about the Spurs possibly not making the playoffs, NBA playoffs, right? Not NFL playoffs, not Major League Baseball playoffs. Like, the NBA <laughs> playoffs, it's just totally absurd when you have R.C. Buford and Greg Popovich running this organization. Yeah, I mean, it's good. it's a shocking, you know, moment for, for people here in San Antonio. I mean, there's there's kids that have gone through their whole educational career, you know, from from, like, from like the start to like to high school and they, they've never seen a Spurs team not in the playoffs. And this, this may be a shock if it does come to fruition, they do miss it. Um, you know, I'm actually surprised they're still holding on their seventh as of right now that we're recording this, but they've, they've gone three and 10 since February 1st. I mean, it's just not, not a good moment right now for San Antonio. I think as we discussed a little bit later, there, there is a positive sign that Kawhi finally might be coming back. But let's, okay. So let's kind of break this down in two facets. Let's break this down as, the San Antonio Spurs 
uh, as a basketball team that wouldn't be so reliant or dependent on Kawhi Leonard, even though everybody and their grandmama knows that if the San Antonio Spurs expect to make it to any kind of NBA playoffs, it has to be with Kawhi Leonard. So why is it they've been giving us this slow death, so to speak? Like they look really good, you know, when, when with Kawhi being gone since the beginning of the year and they fooled us into this, this premonition, this notion that, you know, they got their act together. They're going to be able to compete. We may not say that they're going to win all the time, but they're going to compete. And then suddenly after the NBA All-Star break, it has just actually been a downhill turn. Like you look at this basketball team and you really are recognizing their deficiencies, not even up against a team like the Golden State Warriors, but against almost anyone on any given night that is competitive in the playoff picture. The Spurs are not 100 percent locked in to win those games. Yeah, I mean, there, there's there's some um, there's some factors here. You know, early in the season, they they did have one of the easier schedules to begin the year. So a lot of those teams were minus 500 teams. So you know, they're 24 and six against those bad teams. So so a lot of their wins did come from beating bad teams. Uh, the second part is that they stayed relatively healthy outside of missing Kawhi for most of that. The, you know, the first four months of the season. But then, you know, after after like uh, late January, they started seeing a lot of the top 10 offenses uh, in, in the NBA on their schedule. And not only that, their schedule is just growing, you know, ever since uh, pretty much late January, where, where they're just playing almost um, plus 500 teams each night. And then like the, the one minus 500 team they'll get is like somebody like the Lakers who has beat them already twice this season. And it was working out, you know, having Marcus be the all-star, be the guy that they go to. And there was a lot of role players playing well early in the season. But kind of as Coach Pop has alluded to, um, it just seems like the entire team, they're just running out of gas. Late in fourth quarters, they're, they're relying on a lot of young guys who who just don't have the experience, that corporate knowledge that Pop likes to say. Uh, you know, since February 1st, they're 1-7 in seven in crunch time. And that's obviously, you know, if they win, you know, four or five more of those games, like by not turning it over or not taking bad shots, uh, then, hey, maybe their, their record looks fine. Maybe their third or fourth still in the West. But that has not been the case. They're, like I said, they're, they're, re they're relying on a lot of young guys. And you're seeing now that if they lose to the Rockets on Monday, they will be 10th in the Western Conference. So I'm going to go a route that I don't usually go, you know, and this is something that since we're talking about the Spurs not potentially making the playoffs, I think this is appropriate. And as a person that covers the team on a regular basis like you do, just what is your feel for this this team and roster currently? Obviously, the Kawhi stuff stirred around, and I'm sure you were questioned about that, you know, whether Kawhi was still happy, et cetera, et cetera. But does this team, is it now facing any type of, uh, I don't want to say not identity crisis, but maybe some tension between players and coaches and, and anything that's going on in the locker room here that we may not be seeing or not know from the San Antonio Spurs? I mean, there's not there's not a tension, but you can just tell that there's been some questioning by some of the players, um, especially the veteran guys, guys like Tony Parker, Manu Ginobili, Danny Green, guys that have you know been around, you know, won championships with with this organization, and now that their roles becoming you know less and less each game, especially in closing time when when they're relying, the Spurs want to give you know Dejounte Murray, they're letting um, Patty Mills, Kyle Anderson, a lot of these younger guys close out games, and those guys don't execute. Then then Parker and then you know Ginobili, they're watching from the bench, and and they just you know they're wondering you know what's going on here. Um, as far as, as tension, you know, I just think that let's just say Kawhi was healthy this, this season. They'd probably be top three in the West again, being ready to compete against Golden State and Houston. And I think that's kind of where their mindset's at, whether whether they, they don't make the playoffs or they, they get a, a high uh, seven or eight seed and get bounced real early. Uh, I think that the whole plan is to have this current team with Rudy Gay um, as part of it uh, to see where this team can go, what's their ceiling. And obviously without Kawhi, we're seeing where their ceiling is. It's probably not making the playoffs. Paul Garcia joining us here on the Baseline NBA podcast. Be sure to catch him on Twitter at Paul Garcia NBA. Paul, this roster, this team, what are we actually what are we actually trying to say here? Are we trying to say that the San Antonio Spurs um, really have to start thinking about whatever the whatever tends whatever happens at the end of this season? They really have to start thinking about this team um, moving forward, whether it be with or without Kawhi Leonard. Um, or are we talking about Greg Popovich really dig digging back into his bag of tricks like he did maybe three, four, five years ago and, you know, basically pulling out magic dust to start elevating some of these role player guys? Because I guess part of the, the part of the, the thing that really gets me about this San Antonio Spurs team is this has been a team that has really managed to not be active during around the trade deadline time. They've managed to 
they were one of the few teams, upper echelon teams, that has managed to keep their roster through and through. They don't normally make a lot of hay around trade deadline time. Yet, if you looked at this team and you knowing that Kawhi Leonard was in the state that he's been through most of the season, I would have thought that the Spurs would have really been entertaining to do something. Not so much the fact that the idea was that they needed to move players, but to add on certain pieces to really solidify this trend that they, you know, they, they keep the train rolling. And if they weren't satisfied with what they were getting from their young players, that they would have made a move by the trade deadline to supplant where they needed to be instead of now us wondering if they're going to be good enough to finish out the season being a top eight team in the Western Conference. Yeah, you're not the only one wondering that. You know, the fan base has obviously been very – they were very riled up um, around the trade deadline because the Spurs didn't move. Some of the guys with bigger contracts like Patty Mills, like a Pal Gasol – uh, they wanted, you know, they, they, they the, from the fans' perspective, they could see that the Spurs just, you know, weren't weren't on the right track going into the All Star break. But from the organization, for them to hold back and not make a move, it, again, it it speaks to that they they thought that Kawhi would eventually come back at some point this season because, you know, Paz basically mentioned that where, where they built this team from last season was when Kawhi got hurt against Golden State in that in that uh, Western Conference Finals. You know, San Antonio had a 28 point lead. He goes down. They they end up getting swept. But they thought they were right there with Golden State, and they thought that adding Rudy Gay would be that missing piece to help them get over. You know, to, just take take their team to another level. So for them not to make a move. Uh, at the trade deadline just shows that, that they're trying to go in with these 15 guys, um, you know, plus a healthy Kawhi Leonard. I'm skeptical that they'll have a healthy Kawhi Leonard by the time this, the playoffs roll around. But that, that's kind of what the, what the management side is saying here by, the, by that move. And then also, um, you know, in the offseason, you're right, it's a big offseason because they can give Kawhi the Supermax on July 1st, and he has between July 1st and all the way to like mid-October to sign it. And if he does it, he puts them in a Russell Westbrook situation like last summer, then – you know, how else do they con con construct their team? And that's that's where you have to look at things. Uh, several players have player options. A few guys are restricted free agents. So so there's going to be a, it's going to be a very interesting offseason here for the San Antonio Spurs. So as you alluded to, you're a little bit skeptical, right? And you brought up a great <laughs> point in terms of where they had a softer schedule to begin the year. And looking at the schedule to end the year, though, I only see two cupcakes on, on this entire <laughs> thing. You know, when I see, you know, the Orlando Magic and looking way down the line, you know, you look at, at a team like Sacramento, like the, day, like the next to the last game of the season. Everybody else is in the thick of a playoff hunt. And as you mentioned, the Lakers have beaten them twice. So what does Kawhi, or how much of an impact do you think Kawhi is going to bring? Again, if you don't think he's going to be fully healthy, does he bring some stabilization overall to the, to, the, to the roster enough to really kind of pull this thing out and make sure that this team makes the playoff for the seeming the 100th straight, straight season? Yeah, I mean, he, he's not going to be the Kawhi. I, for, I'm skeptical, as I said, because I, I felt like you needed to give him at least 20, 25 games to really give him some time to, uh, one, be, be get back to being comfortable playing on that injury or on that, that quad where, he, you know, he's still a little, like, hesitant to, to, to get fouled and stuff. You know, be that Kawhi that, that we're used to seeing on TV. And then also there's this whole chemistry issue now with LaMarcus and uh, where LaMarcus is now the go-to guy. He really is, He's really enjoying the season, and you've seen how, how much more productive he can be as a focal point. But when Kawhi comes back, they do have like that old OKC system of Russell Westbrook, Kevin Durant. Like you shared the ball, now it's my turn. And then the other guy's really not uh, effective on on the, on the uh, weak side of the court. So that's something that, that you're gonna need. You, let's just say he comes back Tuesday against Orlando, as been as has been reported. Then that gives him 15 games. If he comes back Thursday against the Pelicans, then that would give him 14 games. And I I just don't feel like that's enough time because even when they brought him back in December. They made him wait two days before he could even play in another game. And they were just basically testing that quad to see how does he feel when he wakes up. And all those times he wasn't feeling right because he couldn't go, he couldn't play basketball after two straight days. He needed two days of rest. So I, I'm wondering too, is that is that injury management plan still in place if he does come back? So again, from my perspective, after seeing this team, I just don't think that they're going to be able to get to that that uh, that chemistry um, standpoint. Uh, and plus Kawhi's confidence, I don't think he'll get there before the playoffs begin. Well, who who are you looking at? For this remaining stretch run and hopefully this stretch run will solidify them to being you know one of the top eight teams um i will say though that it's you know it's hard to imagine that we're actually talking about this team not you know securely uh, as a top four team um and who knows where, where this will play out because everything is so close from five on down to four on down but i'm just really curious who's going to be your x factor for this basketball team um, to carry the Spurs through the home stretch. And and let's obviously not look at whether or not Kawhi Leonard will or will not 
be ready by the time that they do need to make this run? Who's got to carry them home? This is around the time where I'm sitting here saying to myself, damn, I bet you that Greg Popovich, which David Lee didn't retire now, because that to me is what it feels like. If they were, if they had that kind of, that kind of output from Paul Gasol with, with confidence and, you know, other players, guys like Davis Bertrands, you know, last year, you know, certainly helped them. And in, in like, I don't know, he just has dissipated in, in, in many ways. And recently he's, he's shown life, but I'm just saying, who's going to help them on this stretch to put them firmly into this conversation about them being in the playoffs? I think if there's one guy, it has to be Rudy Gay. Um, you know, looking up and down the roster, he's the one guy who can kind of, outside of Lamarcus, who can create his own shot, you know, get get others opportunities. But he, too, ha- had faced like a two-month uh, injury with that heel injury. So he just got back. He's only played seven games since uh, the All-Star break. Uh, he's only, Pop's been very hesitant with his minutes where he's only letting him have 19.7 minutes per game. Um, but, you know, I think that Gay needs to get back to that that that, that level we saw him play in, in Sacramento. He's had a few stretches with the Spurs before he got injured uh, back in like November and December. But again, they, they, I think Rudy Gay is that one guy who can really, really help this team get at least a secure playoff spot, even if Kawhi's not fully back yet, just because, you know, he has to get back to that level, though, of being like a 15 to 20 point game scorer, creating opportunities for other players, especially when LaMarcus is getting double teams. Because when you're relying on, on young guys like Murray or Bertans, like you mentioned, Kyle Anderson, these guys can do it maybe one, one game out of every five games. Rudy Gay has, has a resume where he should be able to do it at least, you know, three, three out of five games. I like what you did there, you know. So now I'm going to, I guess, give you a, a separate challenge, if you will. You know, mm-hmm. who in, in some ways, I already who I, I, I don't want to tell you who I'm going to pick, <laughs> but who in some ways, I guess, has disappointed you this season, um, especially in recent recent weeks when the Spurs have kind of made, made their slide? Who really needs to step their, step their game up and hasn't lived up to, to the billing, so to speak? Uh, you know, since we're going to use Rudy Gay, he would be, he'd probably be one of the players, but again, he's hurt. So I would probably take somebody like, um, like a Patty Mills, maybe where they gave him that contract extension. Obviously he, he's being asked right now to do more than his role requires. Um, you know, usually he's just a spot up shooter kind of runs the, for the offense as a backup point guard. Uh, this season pops, um, most recently he's put him as a starting shooting guard. And again, it's just to get Patty going in the first quarter. Uh, Danny Green can't really do a lot off the dribble. Patty doesn't get to the rim, but he at least, you know, cuts in and, and gets the defense moving so he kicks it out. But, you know, overall, his, his season uh, his season just hasn't been what, what quite what you would want to give a guy who you paid $40 million to, um, that kind of emphasis. And, of course, on the defensive end, he can be a liability. So unless he's, you know, he's really been a spark plug like he, he used to be with the, the Australian national team as, as a shooting guard, I think Patty Mills has been one of the more disappointing players so far for San Antonio. How much dependency should should um, should Popovich have on guys like Deontay Murray, um, guys like Kyle Anderson? Um, you know, these are your um, your homegrown talents, right? And it, listen, it isn't as if these guys are so rookified that they don't know what's what's to expect. They've been a part of the Spurs system now that's been on the successful end, and they've also seen the tragedy of what happens when you don't have star players. Why is it so difficult to get these guys to step up and to fill in the voids of disappointment that we tend to see at times from guys like the Patty Mills and you know, maybe more so the injury-prone guys like Rudy Gay and Paul Gasol who can't give it to you on a night-in, night-out basis? When will those expectations for Deontay Murray and guys like Kyle Anderson who've had years of doing this finally step up and help this Spurs team or are we just are they just going to be who they are uh you know right right now today they kind of are who they are just because like like, like we mentioned you mentioned uh, Kyle Anderson and, and DeJounte a little bit younger uh for DeJounte you know he got the starting role in the beginning of the season because Tony Parker was injured well then he he didn't do so well so then he lost his, all his confidence and pop put Patty Mills in when Parker returned Parker became the starting point guard uh, then DeJounte had a few games in December where he was playing really well. And so Pop eventually handed, handed the keys to him long term. And he's been OK uh, if you watch the first to third quarter. But it's that fourth quarter where he just falls apart, where he starts turning it over. You know, he can't he doesn't have a jump shot yet. So so defense is back off him. And so when, when the pressure mounts on him, that's when he doesn't meet expectations. And again, he's only, I think, 21 or 22 years old. So so you're hoping to see some growth from him down the road. Kyle Anderson's in a different situation. This is already his fourth year. But he's never actually had a real role with the Spurs um, because Kawhi's usually been healthy. This has been the first year where he's actually getting a, a, a legit role. 
Chris Kawhi's been out all year. He's a, he's a small forward. He, he shows really good flashes on, on both ends of the floor. But again, just kind of like a Murray where he doesn't have a jump shot. And so defenses will back off him in the, in the, in the fourth quarter. You know, he has to, he's one of the guys who can get to the rim, but he's almost like that Boris Diaw type where he doesn't do it enough. You want him to be a little bit more aggressive and get to the basket, uh, get to the free throw line. And that's something that he consistently doesn't do. He, he'll have a few big scoring games. But, but that's part of why those two players uh, just have, they, they kind of are who they are right now. So that was my pick for sure. You know, I think you, when you look at certain young guys who get an opportunity um, to, 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 to contribute in, in, a, in, a, in a wide range, if you will, I look at Kyle Anderson, man, and I just feel like he should be doing more with the minutes he's getting. Um, but again, he is inconsistent, doesn't quite have the jump shot. I guess that's necessary because you, you look at a team like Boston all the way in the, East, in the East, Eastern Conference, they see Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, you know, these guys are getting this opportunity now as well as Gordon Hayward going down. They really capitalized on it this year. And they haven't been as inconsistent as Kyle Anderson has been. But I'm going to transition a little bit here to go back to an earlier question. So when I said earlier, I saw only two cupcakes on this on, on that schedule for the rest of the season. What do you feel like is what is the, what is the record that has to happen for the Spurs? Like how many more games do they need to win to potentially get into the playoffs? Because the one good thing I will say this, if if and when Kawhi does come back, is that past this upcoming Tuesday, I guess first Orlando, there's no more back to backs for the San Antonio Spurs. So that's that's a huge thing, I guess, and hopefully for, for Kawhi in essence that he'll be able to play in all of those games. But what do they need to do record wise to, to to probably ensure themselves at least getting into the seventh or eighth seed? So out of these last 16 games, I think that they really need to try to try to win at least eight or nine of them. Um, you know, and that's tough for this team. Uh, I had just I had just done a projection model as of yesterday um, before they played the Thunder, and uh, if they won, if, if if they end up 44 and 38, I, I saw them that they might make the eight seed. But you know, after losing to OKC, that that projection's changed to like 43 wins now. So I think that you got to get at least 45 or 46 wins. To, to be in a safe place to get either that seven, six, seventh, or eighth seed. If you don't get more than, if you get 44 or less, you're really um, playing with fire here. And I don't, and I think it's a huge gamble. Paul Garcia joining us here on the Baseline NBA podcast. Paul, just a couple more questions before we let you, uh, you know, get out of here. Uh, look, I, I'm a firm believer of of uh, not building a tombstone for this, this, this Spurs team. I think there's just way too much veteranship, um, way too much uh, headiness. Uh, with one of the all-time great head coaches in Greg Popovich. Uh, I will say, though, that if this team does make it, what what kind of silver lining are we actually talking about, you know, with the with the San Antonio Spurs? And, and, and I guess the reason why I'm saying this is because at the end of the day, what's always made the San Antonio Spurs um, the type of dynasty, at least from my perspective, uh, that you have to respect is win, lose, or draw, they will they will always be a tough out to anyone whoever they play they will there will always be that question of man you know is this team legit unless they play the San Antonio Spurs and with so many injuries i'm just wondering even if they do make it into the playoffs the one thing that you normally have as a basketball team that has this much success is the fear and the intimidation factor that they bring when they come into the playoffs. Do you think that this is a basketball team? They fight hard, they get all the way to it. Do you think this is a basketball team that can still in fear that, that can still instill that fear and intimidation of being a San Antonio Spurs team by Greg Popovich that can make an impact in the playoffs if they pull this off? It, it, uh, okay, again, if, if Kawhi's present, then yes, uh, toward especially toward the Houston Rockets. If, I think if it's the Warriors, the Warriors will still be you know okay even if um, even if Kawhi's there and Kawhi's even playing at, at some of his top potential. But I think the Rockets are, are the are the tricky question for them. It, it becomes a, a little bit more you know scarier for them just because uh, you know the, Pop has has an upper hand on, on D'Antoni in the playoffs over the years. Uh, obviously, Houston got uh, got better as a team. They have Chris Paul now. They have you know a few more pieces like Luke uh, and Bamute. But you know, a healthy Kawhi with with the Spurs team, who, who kind of knows a system for playing this Rockets team, I think that that can be become an interesting series. If Kawhi's not present at all, I think they'll just get swept by either either the Rockets or, or the Warriors if they end up at seven or eight. But again, if Kawhi comes in here, I think that he he for sure throws a wrench in that Houston series um, if he's present. And then again, with, with Pop's history against D'Antoni. Definitely a mental edge, I think, over those over the over the Houston Rockets per se. You know, I think the best bet, as currently seated, um, if the Spurs get in at six, then you know you can become a very interesting matchup with mm -hmm. what currently is Portland right now. And I don't know that anybody, you know, no matter if 
San Antonio scrapes their way into it, would pick the Blazers even with home court advantage over the San Antonio Spurs in, in a playoff series, even at three and six. Like I just, I just can't see that being the case. So my final question for you though is here, man, as you've watched and and seen, you know, and you've alluded to a little bit here, what type of apocalypse are we looking at if the Spurs do not make it? Like really, what you you know, being in the area, what the case be? What happens in San Antonio? Because Popovich's job isn't on the line. R.C. Buford's job isn't on the line. But what happens if they don't make it? Like how how does that city react to to that to the to this excellence actually ending if it did? I mean, for the city, they you know the fan base they kind of know that, you know if Kawhi's not back, there's they they know the road basically. If they make this, they get the seven or eight seed, they're going to get swept. They kind of know there's there's an ending point here. If Kawhi gets back, then obviously there's there's way more anticipation as to how far this team can go. Uh, you know, if they miss the playoffs, then you. The, the, the fan base, it'll be different. I mean, there's got to be playoffs. I mean, the, the playoff basketball for about two months until the, until the summer gets here. Uh, but but I think that you, you trust the organizations, um, you know, hope that, that they know how to, that, that they're going to draft pretty well. You know, last time they had a, a high pick, which is Kawhi at 15, they, they ended up getting Kawhi Leonard. And obviously they, they made a trade to get that pick. But, you know, you get you get the 13th or 14th pick in the lottery and R.C. Buford's a tight level of scouting. You know, I, I go to games all the time and he's not there most of the time right now during basket, college basketball season because he's out there scouting. You know, he has a heads up on on which players um, are probably going to have a lot of potential. Uh, and so I think that for the Spurs, they'll be they'll be adding a, a new a new talent in, in some sort of lottery pick uh, in the 13th at the 13th or 14th position. But then also, you know, Kawhi, I think he, that he would set, uh, sign that super max. So I think that, that there would be some sort of, um, you know, relief or cyber relief that, that he's going to be okay with his long-term future in San Antonio. And as far as the other free agents, guys like Pau Gasol, like I mentioned, Tony Parker, uh, some of the older players, you know, you have to look at they're going to move those guys and try to try to open up some cast base this summer to try to add some some younger pieces to the team. But any any LeBron in your future? Any LeBron? Are you buying into any of that? Honestly, I was until the whole Kawhi situation. I think that if you're LeBron, if you're really going to tr- test the, the San Antonio experiment, you got to know that Kawhi's healthy. You got to see him playing. You got to know that he's he's 100% committed to the to the to the team. You know, uh, Kawhi finally spoke as of Thursday, but for a while there, you know, all, all we can do is speculate as far as uh, his point of view because he wasn't saying anything. You know, and we had we, nobody seen him on the court in almost a year now when May comes up. Uh, at 100 percent so so if you're lebron i don't know if you if you roll the dice with the spurs situation just because if, if Kawhi comes back and you see him pretty healthy for these last 14 games and maybe like in round one in the playoffs then yeah i think that 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 that, that becomes more intriguing between san antonio and lebron but if Kawhi doesn't he doesn't show it and, and the spurs you know do just get bounced uh at the end of the season i don't think that he would he would send sign san antonio oh it'd be so amazing to see Kawhi leonard he's like oh that quad feeling so much better wow you said lebron's <laughs> rolling with this oh yeah whoo I can flex it right now. I mean, we can go. We can go ball right now. Let's go get that championship, LeBron. Let's go, <laughs> LBJ. Let's go get that chip. He is the man. Does big things uh, for Project Spurs. But you can also catch him on his podcast. It's called the Spurs Cast. Great, great show. Just released uh, recently with uh, at Boomstein, um, and they discussed a litany of the things that we even talked about. Uh, but if there's somebody who we definitely want back on here to give us the "I told you so." Uh, the San Antonio Spurs making the playoffs. <laughs> it's definitely our man, Paul Garcia. Paul, thank you so much for hopping on board with us and breaking down the Spurs for us this week, brother. Thanks, guys. You take care. All right. You're tuned to the baseline. Cali, Warren Shaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. And this was the breakdown. Drop, 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 drop. Time now for the drop. Cali, Warren Shaw of the baseline NBA podcast. And this week on the drop, we got a who you got time. That's just been a while since we did this especially since uh, nba all-star weekend and we picked a very good one shaw i think people are gonna probably have to scratch their heads a little bit you know probably whip out the uh the, you know whip out the, uh, the the ouija boards in order for them to make a very sound decision on this on on this particular um selection of the two guys that we want to put in for who you got so here's how it goes and i'm sure everybody has heard us when we do this we have two individual players. Uh, we give our take of who we would choose um, clearly to start uh, and maybe end a franchise with. Um, but ultimately, these two dudes, man, they, they are certainly centerpiece type players. And it's just a question of at this particular juncture, where they are, not just in their careers, but where they are with their respective teams. If you had an opportunity to choose between who would you go with? Drew Holiday? CJ McCollum. 
So before we get into the in, into your selection, Shaw, I'm just really curious on how you decided to come up with these two players. How did you match these two guys up? Ironically, it's a little bit of synergy, I think, from our last episode. We were talking about how hot the Blazers and Pelicans both are as respective franchises. Now, the Pelicans have slipped a little bit since that last show. But nevertheless, uh, these are really the essential number two guys on both of those teams, CJ McCollum and Andrew Holiday. Now, again, Holiday is the pseudo number two as DeMarcus Cousins went down. But the fact that he's been able to play as well as he has been um, since the 12 or 14 games that Cousins has been out um, really kind of thrust him in into that number two role and, and a key role for the Pelicans' success. So for me, these are two... I want to say lesser known stars you know, on the on their teams on two teams that aren't really that really covered for, for the most part and are only getting attention now because of how great they played since the all-star break. This is a really tough one, Shaw, because I, I look at this not from just the players, but I look at from the dynamic of who the, these players are playing off of. You know, you look at a guy like Drew Holiday. He has basically benefited off of playing with a very young, who is now becoming a much more mature and, and, and more, to the, more to the point, the type of player that I think we've all have been desperately envisioning Anthony Davis to be. And then he also has the luxury of playing next to Boogie Cousins. So ultimately, this dynamic of the most dynamic front court that could possibly be invading you know, the NBA for our generation right now, He's playing in a mix of it. And then you got TJ McCollum, who by far, I don't think gets enough appreciation for what he's managed to do in this in this three-year window uh, of which he's playing next to the likes of Damian Lillard. And, and so that to me is what makes this so difficult, y'all, because I think if we had to take these guys away from the the their respective teams, how 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 much of an impact when you look at a guy like Drew Holiday, who is a former rookie of the year type player and a CJ McCollum, former rookie of the year type player, how their games would actually translate not playing next to some dynamic players that they've been playing for playing with over the last few seasons. I think it's an interesting question simply because I think in Holiday's case, maybe we saw a little a little bit of that early in his career when he's still in Philadelphia. And Iguodala was, I guess, the, supposed to be the star there, but Holiday really kind of emerged on it on his own and was really Philadelphia's best player for for a little while until they unceremoniously moved him out of nowhere, you know, in that trade to acquire New Orleans Noel on a draft night deal. Um, and then ever since he's been in New Orleans, he's, he's, he's been underwhelming, I think, in stages, and then he's been really good, um, especially when healthy. Um, so f for me, I think we've seen Holiday a little bit being the star and that he was able to handle it, actually was an all-star at some point um, in Philadelphia one year, uh, while McCollum has always been in the quote-unquote shadows of Damian Lillard, Lillard in Portland. And you do wonder if McCollum went somewhere else, okay, well, what would that situation be like for him? Could he be a number one guy? And I don't think he's quite that. You know, I don't think we're looking at and not saying in any way, shape, or form they're the same type of player. Uh, but I think that 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 mode that you feel like, oh, if Clay Thompson was somewhere else, you know, Clay Thompson could be, you know, a 28 point 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 game guy with five to seven rebounds. You know, I mean, it could be a, a team's leading scorer easily. But Colin could be a, a great player on a bad team, but I don't know if he could be the the player that you build around. And that is definitely the same thing for Holiday. So I think they're perfect in the roles on the rosters that they're that they're currently on. But it does beg to question, you know, who would you who would you rather have as kind of that number two, uh, you know, second best offensive player on your roster? Well, I kind of feel like their their careers have traveled in 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 I guess you could say polar opposites to where now they could be on a collision course of meet, of a meeting of the mind, so to speak, and how we interpret them. Because when I look at when I look at Drew Holiday and and how his game is translated, remember this guy was a point guard, right? Where in many instances he played more of the two position, and when he comes to New Orleans. They they try to put him back in that point guard position, but ultimately realize that part of his game really is about playing that two. So there was never there was I don't I just don't think he was ever developed to play in a way that we look at a guy like Kyrie Irving or in a in a way that we look at a guy like Steph Curry. Now part of it has been the injuries. He's been always impacted by injuries. And we're not gonna use the injury um, you know, premise here to you know, to deviate from what we're talking about when it comes to Drew Holiday.
But I say that in contrast with 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 CJ McCollum because I often get this inclination with McCollum that he's always wanted to be the two. I don't think he's ever truly been wanting to be the point guard, but because the Portland Trailblazers as a team lack so much in their second unit, they rely so heavily on CJ McCollum, especially in in his in his rookie season and in his second year that he had to basically assume playing a lot of point guard, something that I just don't think that he is truly comfortable with doing. I think he's the kind of guy that wants to be aggressive and wants to score the basketball, less the idea and the onus of having to get other guys involved. And on a team like the Portland Trailblazers, which continuously seems to keep, you know, you know, flirting that frugalness of their bet, the, the, the way that they budget, you know, the talent that they have, it's always going to be something where we're going to undermine C.J. McCollum's true, true potential because I truly believe that he's more of a true two player than I thought Drew Holiday would have been as he had been coming into the Philadelphia system as more of your proto point, um, two the point um, shooting guard, so to speak, if, if if that's how you want to call it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it would be a combo guard. So, and I think you know, and McCollum and Holiday both represent that, but Holiday definitely by virtue of his early NBA days uh, has played more of a true point guard role and I think is a luxury now for New Orleans in that in that two guard position where he is another playmaker that is, is that is natural for him to do. As you alluded to, McCollum is not necessarily, that's not his first mode of, of, of operation. Uh, he can do it, um, especially in times when Lillard has been out for, you know, for patches of games, four and five games there, McCollum slides over. Um, or pl- just I shouldn't say he slides over. He just takes on more of the ball handling duties and trying to dist- distribute the ball. And again, does a lot of that with that second unit as well. That's, that's another reason why Portland kind of even brought Evan Turner over. Uh, obviously, Turner's not a point guard, uh, but it's a guy who has some playmaking ability because outside of those guys, Portland isn't really a great assisting team. Um, so I, I see definitely where you're going with that. But if it were for me, you know, on my money, Holiday by far, far and away is, has just a better overall feel and sense of the point guard position. Um, and, and let's not even worry about point guard, shooting guard, whatever it is, just his ability to play make. Um, and that's evidenced by, you know, his career, you know, 5.7 assists or whatever the case it is this year. Um, and, and I think in that situation, he just has more responsibility. And that's what New Orleans wants him to do, as opposed to Mark Collum, where, yeah, they want him to play more off the ball and, and do a lot more scoring. You're tuned to the baseline, Cali Warren Shaw, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA, our segment of the drop. All right, so I'm not going to waste any time with you, Shaw. I mean, you, you're the one who threw the names up there. You've laid out the, the you know, somewhat of the landscape, so to speak of how we should measure and gauge, you know, our assessment between these two dudes, who would you be taking in a situation where if you're, you know, building this team, building uh, this juggernaut, so to speak, to run, run rough shot against the rest of the NBA, are you taking Drew Holiday or are you taking CJ McCollum? Right. I, in this situation for me, um, it's pseudo prisoner of the moment. You know, I'll, I'll, I will put that into maybe there's a little bias going on right now currently. Um, but in the totality of it as well, too, I just have kind of liked Drew Holiday's game a little bit better because I do feel he's a little slightly more versatile than McCollum. Um, and McCollum, I think, has gotten a lot of, between the two, a lot more publicity, you know, in recent years. Obviously, McCollum winning a, a Most Improved Player of the Year award, which he, he rightfully deserves. Um, you know, and Holiday having some of the injuries. And then he had the situation with his wife where he missed the start of that season, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he's just kind of gone under the radar in New Orleans overall. But I'm watching. I'm, I'm paying attention. Um, and, and again, I, I like Drew Holiday's game. And when it when it comes to a matter, of, is he overpaid or underpaid or what the case may be? Like they're right around the same, you know. But nobody seemed to balk when the Portland gave McCollum all that money. Um, but Holiday's contract is roughly about the same thing, and they're roughly in the same age. I think uh, McCollum's 26 and Holiday's 27, and they're roughly making 25 and 26 million dollars each. Um, so, I mean, when you talk about a who you got it, it couldn't get any more even <laughs> than that, with the exception of Holiday having more years on his deal as well as signing it just last season. Uh, but for me, Holiday, because of his playmaking, because of his ability to even defend, um, and, and I know his defensive numbers have slipped recently because the one's overall defense is pretty bad. Uh, but I, to me, that's a guy who can go out there and, and get you a stop in sometimes, you know, it's usually right up there, you know, amongst the middle of the, uh, middle of the pack and steal leaders and things of that nature as well, too. I know that's an overrated stat. Um, but nevertheless, I like Holiday a little bit more than McCollum because of his versatility. What about you? Um, it, this is a tough one, but probably not as tough. And, and I agree with you, Shaw. Sometimes we become a prisoner of the moment. I think I've just been a prisoner of the mental when it comes to these two type of players. And 
when I look at Drew Holiday, I, I felt like Drew Holiday has had ample time, I guess, to prove me that all of this talent that he has, because I really just think between the two players, he's more talented than C.J. McCollum. Um, I think C.J. McCollum has opportunity to really become a dynamic shooter in the NBA, and I think that that may be his focal point. But the fact that he is truly a, an impressive scorer at this particular juncture, playing next to a guy like Dam Damian Lillard, it to me um, kind of puts me in a point where I feel like McCollum has more opportunity to go get it, where I tend to worry about some someone like Drew Holiday, who has such an all-around great game that at times I think he becomes a prisoner of his own self with, with the way that he can elevate himself. And now you ha you accompany him playing next to two behemoths and, and, and Anthony Davis and, and, and Boogie Cousins, and I tend to keep questioning what kind of Drew Holiday would he have been had he not played next to those guys. Now that you have seen him play next to some high-profile players, I still don't see a Russell Westbrook-like in him, whereas that's something that I have seen in C.J. McCollum from time to time because Damian Lillard has been injured, and C.J. McCollum has had to shoulder the, the, the Portland Trailblazers. And it's been more prevalent because of how Terry Stotts has had to depend on, you know, C.J. McCollum being the primary ball hander and also being the scorer. Now, he's never going to get as many assists. He's probably not going to get you as many rebounds as what you're capable of getting with Drew Holiday. But I think that he's capable of shooting the ball better than Drew Holiday. I think he's capable of exploding on any basketball team that he plays against when the time is right. And I think if you had to separate these guys from their souls of the teams that they play with, I ultimately see C.J. McCollum being a far more dynamic um, uh, individual player that can impact. And I think for me, that's something that I definitely would look for, um, regardless of whether or not you have a great all-around game. It's how your all-around game translates to your aggressiveness when it needs. Like, how do you utilize each of those components to help your team win? If C.J. McCollum has only, only has two of those components in comparison to Drew Holiday— I probably will take C.J. McCollum more so because he's going to maximize those two components a lot more than I think I see with Drew Holiday at this particular juncture. You know, it's funny because I think I think that's fair. Um, but in the same breath, you know, if we're, if we're going to look at it even right what, right now, what's going on in this current season, right? Holiday is at 19.2 points per game, 5.7 assists, 4.3 rebounds. McCollum at 21.8 points per game, 4 rebounds, 3.2 assists. Then you give a bump to Holiday, who has 1.4 steals, you know, with the McCollum's 0.9. The key really in all this, too, because the minutes are almost exactly the same, too. 36 and a half for Holiday, 36 for McCollum. Both those guys need to be on the floor for their respective rosters. Um, and then Holiday has an edge in, in overall plus minus as well, too. But what it comes down to is I think even with Holiday this current season, a lot of his numbers, the first half of his numbers are skewed because he's, he's taking 15.4 field goal attempts a game to McCollum's 18.5. And why is that? Well, there were some Marcus Cousins on the New Orleans Pelicans roster for the majority of, of the time. So I think for, for uh, to your point, though, I will say this. McCousins only been there since the latter part of last year and up into this year. Holiday had opportunities to really shine if he wanted to to, to be and maybe to, to not have people have balked at his, at his current contract number when it was originally signed. And I feel like a lot of people thought it was a lot to invest in a guy who's been hurt, who's had some issues, et cetera, et cetera, and hasn't really produced in the same manner and, and fashion. If this is the Drew Holiday that we're that we've seen this season, um, and he's been pretty consistent, even with Cousins there, um, I still feel like he's a better overall product um, than, than McCollum. But McCollum is a better scorer, is a better from the three point line, even better from the free throw line. Uh, but but to me, I just I I value the overall versatility that Holiday can bring you, especially because I think he could go out there and get you a stop when it's necessary. And we all know, you know, when it comes to basketball, you need to play both sides of the basketball. McCollum typically has been a sieve when it comes to defensive side of the basketball. I mean, and I'm not going to argue with that aspect of it, Shaw. I completely agree with you. I think maybe this might be an interesting question um, for you and maybe for other people who have been, you know, who are tuning into this part of the segment of the show. If Drew Holiday was the kind of player that I think you know that he's capable of being, would the New Orleans Pelicans have ever made the play to still get Boogie Cousins? That, I think that to me is what's always been what's egging at me. Is whether or not, you know, let, let's not forget Drew Holiday was a rookie of the year player. He was, he basically was a focal point in 
what we thought is the turning of the corner, so to speak, with the Philadelphia 76ers, post Elton Brand and post Andre Iguodala. And I don't know what may have happened. Maybe the, the, this trade actually soured him. I mean, because then we saw Michael Carter Williams go out there and, and become a rookie of the year because of this, right? But my point is, is what kind of impact would that have for a guy like Drew Holiday, who was easily giving you 20 points per game and still giving you five or six assists and still giving you four or five rebounds per game if he was even able to 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 to, to um, equate some of that same numbers in those early years with the New Orleans Pelicans would Demps have been so I don't want to use the word desperate but would he have been still liable to try and pull a trigger to go mm. get you a player like Boogie Cousins? I mean, we would be talking about another. That. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Sure. I'm going to throw that right now. It's, it's the Marcus Cousins, and as as we've alluded to on the show a hundred times over, what they had to give up for Cousins, you do that no matter who else is on your roster for the most part. So I think yeah, there's some but, but, there's but some. We're sea talking, legs, but what we're so talking saying. about, Shaw. But what we're talking about, Shaw, is where the New Orleans Pelicans were at that particular time frame. It's hard pressed for me to believe that the way that Drew Holiday plays the game that we're seeing him play right now, that that would not have translated to the New Orleans Pelicans being much more competitive and much more in sync with where they were in the Western Conference than how they, than the way that they dictated, you know, making the play for that particular trade. I guess what I'm saying is, is that remember, with Drew Holiday, they, them and Anthony Davis, they found themselves in the, in the Western Conference playoffs. They were in eight seed, and they played against the Golden State Warriors, right? So w what happened in that time frame from that when we talked about how, hey, this is the Drew Holiday that we definitely would love to see more, more often. This is the Anthony Davis at an MVP level that he's label, liable to carry a basketball team. We didn't see that the following year. You know what I'm saying? And that's what I'm wondering, like, where are you going to find a happy medium with a guy like that in Drew Holiday? It's it to me. I, I I use this type of analogy. It's like you knowing that you're going to go get you a five tool baseball player. The problem is is that most of the time he's only good at three of those five tools. So are you going to continue to sit here and wait for him to get good at those other two parts in which that's what you need in order to be a championship winning team? Or are you either going to settle for the fact that they're good at the three, you keep him at those three, and he excels at those three, or are you just going to basically move him along so you can find someone that's going to get you the things that you need to win championships with? That's what I always worry about with a guy like Drew Holiday, a 5 tool basketball player who only uses three tools from time to time, and you keep wondering when he's going to make all five of those tools work if that was why you brought him on your team. All right, so your penalty to Holiday is more or less that he's not living up to his full capability, and McCollum is, even if Holiday has more overall talent. Because that's, I mean, that's what it sounds like, and, and and that's the situation. Again, it's definitely a knock, and I think as as you see in, in in all sports, sometimes you just get tired of waiting for guys to to get there because you do know that they can do and should be doing more. But I think in the case of Holiday, you know, right after right after um, they made the playoffs that year, you know, that's when he had the injuries. And then, you know, the season right after that, that's when his wife had the cancer scare. So, and again, he wasn't in the right mental space or physical space in, in both of those years and just hasn't been his full self. And I think this is the first year he's came in without having really having to worry about it. And then this year, they fully shifted him out of position um, to, to begin the year. So I was very concerned. So I want to close with this because, you know, we have to move on and everything like that, too. But let me ask you this one question here. If you ha who do you think and like let's even bump them down a little bit. Do you think Holiday? You think Holiday could be as good as he's been, you know, with Cousins still on this roster? So we kind of saw what he was doing with Cousins still there. Do you think the, you think McCollum could put the same numbers with that level of star on his roster? If McCollum is now not getting 18, 19 shots a game and he now has to get 14 shots a game, 12 shots a game, whatever. You know, do you think McCollum can still be as productive if he was now the third star as to like the way Holiday was operating early in the season? Mm. That's tough. That's tough. Um, I think. No. Yeah, and I agree. You know, I really do. And, and not as a matter of like, you know, trying to you know, win a point or win an argument here in this situation is just because because Holiday is more versatile, you know, in in overall as, as a basketball player, 
he can complement a roster more so. Like McCollum has to be a guy who's scoring and getting getting touches at the end of the day. Well, Holiday's like, all right, I can pick my spots now and I can do this here and play a little defense here, et cetera, et cetera. But again, you know, if it was like, all right, well, who did you just want to go out here and try to win a basketball game with? You probably pick McCollum because of the, you know, scoring and you know, hey, that's that's what's that's what excites the mind to some degree. But my my argument is just that again, you're looking at if I'm looking at a basketball roster and, and the overall versatility of it. What do I need? A guy who can still give me 17 to 18 points a game, a guy who can give me 19 or 21, but can still give me six assists as opposed to three assists. Um, you know, that's why I would pick Holiday in this situation. But, you know, let's let our fans decide, man, because I think this was a good one. Um, again, they are really, really even. 27-year-old Holiday, 26-year-old CJ McCollum. They both average around the same, roughly the same points per game, getting both, both about the same amount of money. Um, you know, 25, 26 million each. Uh, this is a great, great question for our fans. So hopefully they tune in um, and give us some feedback on this one. Yeah, man. So have we screwed up your minds even more so now that we threw these names out and, and our reasonings behind who we would be choosing? Who you got? <laughs> you ain't definitely got us, but we got you. Be sure to get at us at NBA Baseline. Cali, Warren Shaw, Baseline, NBA Podcast. And this was The Drop. Time now to go coast to coast discussing the news in the association. You ready to rock and roll, Mr. Shaw? Absolutely, man. Let's ride. All right. Say it ain't so. The Minnesota Timberwolves, I guess they're, they're pulling it all out, man. Oh, they Nonstop. They got to get whoever they want on this train to run to the to the, to the the playoffs to get to the championship. So that means that they got to get their man D. Rose, Tibbs and Rose. They back together again, singing those songs of freedom for the Minnesota Timberwolves. Timber Bulls, man. That's what it boils down to if you follow on social media. I like media. that. I like that. <laughs> Hashtag that. Tag it, it was up, everywhere. Baby. It was everywhere. Timber Bulls, you know, are definitely in effect. Thibodeau bring in all his former guys, um, you know, especially Jimmy Butler being out um, till probably the end of the season, uh, end of the regular season, if you will. Needed some, some depth behind, I guess, Jeff Teague and such. We'll see how it works out, man. But D-Rose, Tip is back together, man. Yeah, and then, you know, probably before the season ends, they'll, they'll probably figure out a way to bring Jim Paxson onto this basketball team, and it'll really look like the, the Timber Bulls, right? You know. <laughs> yeah, right, whatever. All right, out in uh, Detroit, Stan Van Gundy is now officially on the hot seat. Listen, he's not short of hot takes, but if this Detroit Pistons basketball team don't find themselves in the playoffs, he certainly should be on the hot seat. Yeah, it's tough. You know, the Blake move was great the first four or five games, and it just, you know, took off like a lead balloon after that. And there was nothing popping for, for Detroit Pistons basketball. Um, Blake is, you know, he's had his ups and downs there trying to adjust. Um, and I think, you know, Van Gundy has a little bit of role to play in that, obviously. Uh, Reggie Jackson hasn't come back from his injury. I know he's supposed to be close, uh, but this Pistons team is definitely not looking like one that is actually going to make the playoffs in the East. And Van Gundy's job deserves to be in the hot seat after all the moves and adjustments he's made over the last couple of seasons. I will say this much, though. I think that his him being an executive, that should be the hot seat part. I don't think that Stan Van Gundy is a bad coach. I think it'll depend on how the players respond and react to him after the season ends. And it's certainly, you know, they don't play to the idea that Blake Griffin is a marquee player and they got to acquiesce to him. But I, I will say that he he is mirrored a lot like Doc Rivers uh, with the L.A. Clippers. And I find it interesting that Blake Griffin is right in the middle of it. So <laughs> we'll see how this plays out. Uh, there's still some games left to be played, but it's really not looking good. And if you're Stan Van Gundy, the executive uh, that part of your your title uh, may be stripped away a lot sooner than it had been for Doc Rivers when he was the president of basketball operations for the Los Angeles Clippers. Out in OKC, Carmelo Anthony uh, is now an official top 20 scorer of all time. Kudos to Carmelo. Shout out to Melo, man. Stay Melo. Keep doing your thing. You know, great accomplishment to reach that top 20 list in scoring. And again, it's going to be a Hall of Famer. As many people really don't want to hear that and believe that. You know, Carmelo Anthony is a Hall of Fame basketball player. So shout out to him getting it done. You know, what is this? His 14th, 15th year, whatever it is. Like, you know, this is this is a great accomplishment for a guy of his stature. I don't understand why people are making a big deal about him not being or not deserving to be a Hall of Fame basketball player. The numbers that this guy puts up... <laughs> Yeah, you know, and again, it's that same tired old conversation because how many great play? This is exactly the reason why the NBA tends to have a, a, a gap in its understanding of the history of the game because a lot of the players who have done historical things didn't have championships. 
you know, and it's it's funny. We seem to equate that when we talk about the NFL, or we try to equate that when we talk about Major League Baseball. But there are a litany of players in the NBA who went on to do great things. And statistic, even when you add the numbers, and they did not have an NBA championship to show for it. And it's only until they get on TNT, uh, on or they get on radio, or they get on ESPN that we recognize the accolades of the things that they accomplished as personalities rather than what they were actually doing on the basketball court. But I guarantee you, you'll probably find 15 or 20 footages on YouTube and they were right in the middle of, of, of all of that craziness that was going on and why the NBA was one of the more popular sports to watch and play at that time. Interesting in itself. Finally, Shaw, Dwayne Wade, he is stepping up his community efforts. I mean, listen, you can't get more communal than him coming back and helping the Miami Heat get into the NBA playoffs down there in Miami. But, of course, we're talking about community efforts. Yeah, with Wade, you know, doing a lot. You know, I live in the South Florida area. So, um, you know, with, with Mark Stoneman, Stoneman Douglas, shooting that happened a couple of weeks ago now, um, he's been just great um, and working and curating some some, some stuff for that school and that, you know, and, and, and those students at, at, at that um, in that entity there, man. So um, he had, a, he went to the school recently, he's having something out, he had something out in the Wynwood area, you know, trying to raise some money and raise awareness as well to um, and Wade is just kind of everywhere, you know, with his overall community efforts. So definitely wanted to shout him out for that because, um, you know, those are the types of things that don't get a lot of coverage, even on our program, but in general. Um, and I think it's a great thing that Wade has been able to do and, and reach out to the to the, uh, the, 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 the community of Roger Stoneman Douglas and do what he's been doing the last couple of weeks. Yeah, if you're in politics, take some notes from what actual athletes do who come from these areas and, and how they give back to their communities. I mean, this is exactly the reason why we have uh, kind of an equilibrium, so to speak, something uh, that can help balance out a, a lot of the things that tend to get, you know, rustled, you know, kind of, you know, folded into the fray of our understanding of, of why it's important to have sports, why kids have sports in their lives, why we play, why we participate. And when athletes, um, generational players, Hall of Famers like Dwayne Wade, who Listen, by all stretch of the imagination, he doesn't have to do these things, but he chooses to do these things. It's not for the publicity. It's specifically for the public, and the public benefits from this. And it's it's more so of a sign for us. We have to keep it moving. We need to pay it forward. And he's setting the, the standard. He's putting... He's putting us, you know, on notice to say we should also do more as well, too. And we applaud Dwayne Wade. We applaud uh, the Miami Heat organization uh, for allowing him the ability to do this and giving him the platform for him to continually be an integral part. That's why it's called Wade County down there, man. Not because of the great things that he did on the basketball court, but because of the great things that he does off the basketball court as well. This has been another awesome show. Once again, Shaw, uh, fresh out the box ready to get it popping and as we are head right into the uh, you know middle of March man it's getting good there's March madness um on the horizon NBA basketball is coming at full tilt ready to round out the rest of the season man a lot of games to be played and a lot of eyeballs watching that western conference as it is a log jam to try and get in where they fit in for sure you know again this is a great great time of year the closing weeks of the NBA season right before the playoffs. You know, pretty soon, you know, we usually do like a race for eight type of situation in one of our shows. You know, in the West, we wouldn't even know where to go. It's going to be, you know, the, the race for three through nine, you know, and some some crazy conglomerate of what's going on out there. But we'll definitely keep our pulse and, ta and keep the tabs on what's going on both conferences as we, as we always do, man. Amazing show. Thanks to our guest, Paul Garcia, for jumping on. Um, you know, and I hope people are going to enjoy a little March Madness, man. You know, it should be a great week of basketball overall. Most definitely. So for the baseline, Cali, Warren Shaw, we appreciate you guys, each and every single one of you. And we'll catch up with you next time. <laughs>